and welcome everyone. I am uh, particularly excited about uh, the next hour and a half in, in part uh, because I know something about each of these sites uh, and, and uh, also in part because uh, they encountered struggles, but uh, they overcame those struggles in most cases and were able to end up with a successful project. Uh, I think one of the things that'll be uh, evident early on is, uh, and it's common across all three of these sites, uh, Anniston, Alabama, Miami, Florida, and Salisbury, North Carolina, they have their different kinds of places. They have different kinds of crime problems, uh, different communities, and yet um, the commonalities, I think, are stronger than the differences. One of them is the enthusiasm that each of the sites brought to these projects. I know a, a little bit more about Anniston, uh, though I, I know a good deal about Miami and Salisbury as well. Uh, the research partner, the law enforcement team uh, in each of these three sites uh, began the project with enthusiasm. And I, I think it's fair to say ended it uh, with enthusiasm as well. Another common feature across these three sites uh, is the role of the research partner. Uh, sometimes a project begins and the local law enforcement is unsure what they're gonna get from their research partner. In these three instances, as is most typically the case, I think both groups, uh, the law enforcement and research partners found uh, much in common and uh, much to learn from each other. Uh, I know in particular in Miami, and you'll hear uh, from Miami in just a bit, uh, that enthusiasm was uh, so great on both sides that there is a formal long-term collaboration uh, between uh, the university and the police department that I think is going to go on for quite for quite some time. I want to point out as well that um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, as Amada Ban noted, uh, provides funding uh, competitive through a competitive review process, provides funding for these projects, and we at CNA provide the training and technical assistance. I want to make an observation about federally funded programs. Often they don't last more than three or four years. They barely get started. Uh, they get a, a foothold and then um, other priorities are met or priorities change. This is the 14th year for the Smart Policing Initiative uh, that began in 2009. We don't find lots of interventions, and, and to my mind, uh, I think Project Safe Neighborhoods, which has come and gone, would be, would be one. Uh, but also Weedon Seed, that many of us remember, uh, created partnerships, targeted interventions, lasted more than a decade. But for SPI to be in its fourth year, 14th year, excuse me, with 80-some uh, sites where SPI interventions have occurred, I think really says something about the utility of the approach. So as you listen today, think of this as a chance to uh, take back to your community some of the lessons learned in these three communities. Those three communities are, as I pointed out, Anniston, Alabama, Miami, Florida, and Salisbury, North Carolina. We're going to get a, a presentation of 20 to 24 minutes, and I'll be calling time and keeping time uh, for each of those sites so that we can leave time for questions and answers at the conclusion of, uh, of today's session, uh, as well as people will know that they have the opportunity to go look up uh, this recording at a, a later date, it doesn't take too long to process them, as well as the final reports that have been submitted uh, for, for, I believe, all three of these jurisdictions, uh, and, and as they get reviewed, are placed up on our website. Well, S Spark Policing uh, has 
the goals to extend or establish evidence-based programming in police agencies to increase their ability to effectively and sustainably prevent and respond to crime. Now, that's a big mouthful, uh, but I think the key takeaways here are the ability to mount an intervention and sustain it. We've all had uh, projects that come and go. Sometimes it seems like they just start to produce an effect when uh, a new project replaces them. And, and a key goal that makes SPI different is the emphasis on sustainability. There are also uh, some of the methods that are common across SPI projects uh, that include the use of technology, technology intelligence, and data. Um, we don't think that there's one answer to better understanding uh, a community's crime problems and building a response that's based on that understanding. The data that exists, whether it's used to do maps or trend analysis or ide identify um, prolific offenders, uh, it has to be balanced alongside the intelligence, the knowledge that officers who've served on beats in communities for a long period of time in a city really bring to the understanding and bring to the table. Um, in the end, what SPI focuses on is to take resources and focuses them on uh, people who are concentrated in communities that have high levels of crime. So it's high concentrations of criminal behavior and crime that are the primary objects of SPI interventions. And it's also important that um, communities provide examples for other cities who face crime problems, uh, perhaps similar to their own. I, uh, I grew up in Chicago. I think of myself as a big city person. But I, I know that uh, small towns and medium population cities also face serious crime problems as well. And I think you'll see in the presentation uh, from our group from Anniston, Alabama, uh, that they do face serious crime problems in smaller jurisdictions under 50,000 population, uh, but are able to respond to that. And there's a, a, a thirst for knowledge on the part, not just of the big five cities, but across cities of a variety of sizes. If you wanna take a look at uh, the next slide, it shows uh, the, the map of the US where the uh, projects have been located over since the 2009 initiation. There have been 114 SPI projects. Um, the majority take place in large cities, 35, out of those on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, uh, 19 have taken place in small communities. So uh, they're an equal, uh, equally important partner in this process. The majority have uh, been funded through local police departments, though 10 uh, sheriff's departments, notably uh, uh, Sacramento, Sacramento County Sheriff, if you have a homeless problem, you want to take a look on the uh, SBI website for their final report, and, and state police. If we go to the next slide, one of the things uh, that we note is that it's important to follow the evidence, uh, and follow the evidence through each of these sites that you would look at about uh, a, a way in which um, the innovation that took place in Chicago, in Rochester, New York, in Detroit, Michigan, Commerce City, Colorado, Portland, uh, small cities in the, in the case of Commerce City, uh, and then more medium size for Portland and Rochester, and then Detroit and Chicago, larger cities. Um, different approaches that were built on an understanding of uh, different problems. And I will, would say, and, and we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll be ready to pass the baton off to Anniston. I would say that knowing uh, the sites that are making presentations today, uh, that they would gladly field uh, questions 
uh, emails from you all down the road. Um, I, I think there's lots of innovation that took place in Anniston and, and uh, Captain uh, Justin Sanford is gonna tell us about that. Um, and I'll pass the microphone as it were along to you, Justin, please. Thanks, Scott. He said, I'm Captain Justin Sanford. I'm with the National Police Department. I'm over our Special Operations Division. Um, I was the project manager on our SPI grants. Um, so I've, I've been with this project since day one. Um, and uh, just go over a little about our grant. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, a little background on Aniston. We've got 91 sworn officers. We've only got a city population of about 21. Uh, 1,000 people, but we do serve a police jurisdiction three miles outside our city limits, which is just about as big as our city limits itself, so it brings up to about 41,000. And uh, a couple reasons we got into the shape we did with our crime rate and what's been going on in Anniston's. Uh, we used to have Fort McClellan here in Anniston, and it was a very bright, uh, vibrant fort. Um, it closed in 2000. And we lost about 4,000 uh, military and civilian jobs because of that. Um, another significant thing about Aniston is we had uh, Monsanto here. If you're familiar with PCBs, um, they were pretty much dumping these pollutants in our, our area for several, several decades. And uh, it ended up polluting a lot of the land. Uh, we started seeing people coming down with cancer and other illnesses, um, all because of that pollution. So between Fort McClellan closing and uh, Monsanto and the uh, contaminants, we started seeing a loss of population. And uh, from about 2000 to this year, it's been about 21% of our population that, that have moved and they've left behind about 2000 dilapidated structures too. Um, just because nobody wants to come back into the area when you start seeing news articles about uh, what's been going on here. So, uh, you know, when you start looking at several studies on it, but uh, poverty and then the structures, whether you're looking at the broken window theory and stuff like that, that can start breeding crime in itself. Um, we wanted to, uh, we were getting kind of dated here, um, just older mentalities. Uh, the best thing for police work was absolutely boots on the ground and what the investigators and the officers knew. And there was a whole lot of collaboration going on there. We had our little silos like everybody else. And so we wanted to get into some intelligence-led policing on top of our traditional policing methods. So some of the key issues that led us to this um, was we, we were in several publications, but um, they, they go per capita. But we were hitting these lists of top 10 dangerous cities in America, in Alabama. So um, the, the most recent publication that had us listed was May of 2019, and it was using FBI data from 2017. And it was because of our violent crime rate, but our uh, property crime rate wasn't uh, helping us out any. Um, motor vehicle theft and larceny were increasing. Um, but not in the state or in the U.S. at the same time. Um, we were using our publicly available data to get this, our, our CAD system, uh, records management system, and we partnered with Jacksonville State University. Um, they had worked with us in a couple other projects before this, um, and one of them was a data analysis project. So they were able to use some of that data and then the new data we were providing them um, when we were looking at this grant. Um, so they, they were also very key to us getting this grant and um, fr from, from day one, getting with them to go over everything that needed to go in here. And uh, we just, we didn't have the capability. We're a smaller agency. A lot of times people are pulling double duties as far as what their roles are here. And uh, an example of, of just some of the issues we run into we have an IT specialist who comes in and services the whole city. He's here two days a week. So um, th those are just some of the things smaller agencies deal with. And so it really helps having a local community partner like JSU who can uh, step in and help fill some of the gaps that we have here at the police department. 
Uh, next slide, slide please. <clears throat> so the strategies we wanted to implement into this grant were uh, nothing really new, but kind of new to us. Um, hotspot policing, um, uh, closed circuit television, um, and LPRs. Um, and again, some of the partners we were going to use to implement the strategy was JSU to help us with the analytic um, part of it. And then also we had to partner with the business community because we knew we were going to put some of this equipment around some of those areas and also our housing community, um, the city itself, and uh, of course the federal, state, and local partners. We were fortunate enough to be going through a public safety partnership um, at the same time that we were going through our SPI grant. So we really had a lot of attention from uh, federal, state, and other local partners, and we had that. It was great the way that just married up because we had um, other agencies in our area, too, um, that normally we didn't have great uh, relationships with uh, before PSP, and uh, that kind of brought us all together. And so everything just helped out. It piggybacked off one another. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we used data set analysis over three different treatment areas uh, with three control areas. Um, we didn't get to get every single area when we were looking initially of where we wanted to put the cameras and the license plate readers in this intervention. Um, some of it was just a geographical issue. Some of it we, we just couldn't, I mean, get the cameras where they needed to go. But we felt like we, we were able to get three um, pretty good spots for it in three control areas um to correspond to those spots to make sure that we were getting a, a pretty good picture of what was going on um the findings from the evaluation we had low counts of data um, which resulted in mixed results that was to be expected with an agency our size and the amount of crime that we do have here um but the weighted displacement quotient um it was positive for all property crimes aggregated and that pointed to a decrease in property crime with no corresponding displacement of crime to another location or another crime itself um that was something that uh i, I mean we, we can look at that data and i can see going through the, each one of the treatment areas uh what what the crime looked like and you could see those mixed results in there but i want to just point out right here too the public perception from what we were expecting and what we received completely different we're in the south we figured there was going to be all kinds of privacy concerns about these cameras going out and going up and it was completely opposite of what we expected we had a, a whole lot of support from the community uh, people reaching out to us wanting to see this in other areas because they were talking to their neighbors and you really can't replace that. Um, you can't look at that with just a set of numbers, uh, just the quality of life from neighbors saying, hey, this has really made a difference being in our area, talking to their neighbors. Now the other neighbors want the same thing in their areas. And so uh, I'll get into that later, but that is that is something we're growing right now uh the impacts we've had here at APD um it's it's changed how we we operate um like I said we were kind of dated in the way that we were handling operations before um now it's just a great resource for the investigators to be able to come in and look at video or even patrol officers to be able to come in and look at video um supervisors themselves if we're um dispatching calls or we've got units in an area, then being able to go into our viewing room and uh, pull up any one of these cameras from that area and get real time information as the calls going on or as the officers responding and be able to put that out um, makes a huge difference um, with the way we're able to do things now. Uh, we're solving more crimes. Um, we're, we're actually able to allocate resources better because of this. And that was another huge um, need, especially with COVID coming through, which happened during this evaluation. Um, and uh, I said we're, we're 91 sworn. There's been times we've gotten down into the 70s over the past two years, which is a, a pretty good um, decrease in our numbers over that time to be able to allocate uh, resources effectively. So um, that really helped out having these additional resources. Um, 
in that, like I said, in the community, we've had just an overwhelming positive response. I have not had one complaint about any of this equipment. We we did uh, social media campaigns. We did some uh, press releases. We've done in-person community meetings on this. We, we made sure that before and after implementation of this uh, equipment, that everybody who was going to be affected by it was well aware of what we were doing. And so I think that probably helped with the transition of, uh, of what we were doing with this project. Next slide, please. Some of the sustained activities we've uh, kept going since implementing this inter intervention. Um, before, um, we weren't keeping up with if we were using video in a case other than in uh, the case report itself. The case file is the only place you're going to find if you're using video. So we've got this viewing room here at the police department. And in there, we've, we've got a log so we can look back and it, it gives a pretty good snapshot of which investigators are using it, uh, which officers are using it. Any cases, we're writing down case numbers they're, saw, uh, they're, they're using the equipment for. And that way we can also keep track of that on the back end. It's easier to just take that master list and go find the status of the cases and see if it's effective or not um, with, with those records. Um, like I said, the daily activities of what the investigators and the officers are doing and the supervisors, um, that has changed. Um, we do have supervisors who will go into that room and assist those officers using that video, clearing the scene before the officer even gets there. We've got phenomenal video, by the way, and the cameras that we purchased. I, I couldn't be any more thrilled with the equipment we did receive from this grant. Um, but it's able to do a lot. Um, the main, I, I guess the main officer we have in here is our traffic accident investigator. That is something we weren't thinking about when we put all these cameras up, but it has helped him tremendously with his accidents. Um, a lot of the accidents we would get where it was one party says this happened, the other party said this happened, and we just go back to the video and he's able to uh, spend less time on a lot of his investigations and then dedicate that time to some of the more serious traffic accidents, especially involved traffic accident homicides. Um, we have obviously the new tools here. We purchased cameras, LPR readers, and uh, two different style cameras, mobile trailers and fixed camera systems that were in box cameras. But outside of this grant, we had to figure out what we we're going to do with that video. So we also had to purchase a fairly large DVR to, to save that video. And we, we save it for about two months. And that's if it's not being used. It rolls off after about two months of, of storage. If it's a video that's being used for anything crime was detective, it's an, uh, detected or it's an open case, then obviously we'll save that video forever. It becomes part of the case file. But um, it, we found that if we're not tracking back more than 60 days, more than likely we're not going to need that video past that time. Uh, crimes are usually reported within two weeks to us. Um, it's rare that anything goes over than two weeks. We also had to develop some new roles. Um, like I said, we have to wear different hats here. Uh, I work with a lieutenant in our division, and primarily that lieutenant's uh, duties used to be a second traffic accident investigator, and he just supervised a couple of units. But now his main duty is going out, servicing this equipment, making sure it's up and running, uh, any kind of equipment allocation, he, he's going to have to deal with that, uh, moving it where it needs to go, finding out where it needs to go, coordinating with investigators. And then also, uh, like I said, repairing this stuff. We, we just, we can't afford, we don't, we don't have the budget to hire specialists to come in and work on this stuff. So we've had to learn to work on this equipment ourselves. So pretty much we've become these camera mechanics, if you will, um, running around. And we, we've actually gotten pretty good at it. Uh, we don't have equipment that, that stays down more than an hour or two. Um, and, and that's because of, just learning as we were uh, implementing uh, all this stuff. The impacts in the community, again, we had, uh, we had the 
positive public perception, but we also developed some new partners. Um, we have the East Metro uh, Crime Center, Area Crime Center, which is just a regional real-time crime center, and it's right next door to us. So we collaborate a lot with them, um, and then they have, I'm going to say it's 28 regional partners and regional federal and state partners who are also involved in that center. And uh, it's uh, opened up relationships with a lot of those partners too, again, that may not have touched our city or may not even been in our county, but the criminals, they, they go back and forth between the region. So our criminals can be their criminals too. And so they get a lot of uh, advantage from us having this, this intervention in place. Next slide, please. Uh, the challenges we, we faced, um, like I said, we didn't get to place some of the cameras where we wanted to. In Alabama, um, a lot of the poles that we want to put this equipment on were owned by Alabama Power or one of the utility companies. They do not allow law enforcement or anybody else to place equipment on their, uh, on their facilities without uh, a court order, basically, and then you have to renew, renew that every so, so many days. Um, they have their own where they will lease you the equipment and put it on their poles, but when you look at the cost difference between you just buying it and owning it outright, you're paying three to six times more to lease the equipment from them. So that was one of the challenges was uh, we had to either find unused city poles that we had and uh, redeploy them or we had to buy new poles and get them in there. Another consideration was uh, power usage um, and some of the areas we will put this equipment just didn't have the infrastructure to support getting, getting power there. Solar wasn't always an option with some of these devices. Um, we also started running into almost immediately some defects in the equipment. Uh, it was it was petty stuff, uh, a POE switch where the cameras used uh, it to power and communicate it's about a four hundred dollar component. I, I've noticed in the trailers and even in the box cameras, those are one of the first components that you're going to have go out in there. Um, fortunately, what we learned is an easy fix. Um, we, we, we know what to buy. We know um, how to go up there and, like I said, change that out pretty quickly. Um, but it was one of the things we started encountering is you just know that the camera's down and now you got to go figure out why it's down. And so that is that was a learning curve for us. Uh, the batteries we initially got for the trailers, again, these trailers are solar powered um, with the batteries. Some of them we were getting a couple days out of that dwindled down to one day before we'd have to pull them in and fully charge the batteries. Some of the trailers, they were rocking on a year without us having to do anything. That was really the electrical load that we had on the batteries versus the, the, what the solar panel could take in. Um, so they were AGM batteries. We, we learned that we really needed lithium batteries in there, um, and we were able to get some lithium batteries, and that did make a huge difference. Um, some of the ways we, uh, we addressed those challenges were just pretty much hands-on learning, uh, just learning as we go. We did take some courses. One of the most beneficial courses I took was the Axis Network Video Fundamentals course. Um, they have one of those in Atlanta. They've got them all over the country, but even if you're not using Axis cameras, it's very beneficial just to go through that program. They'll, they'll teach you how to build a camera network and everything you need to know about the settings of a camera. It's a good way to keep costs down and to go ahead and you'll, you'll understand problems when you're looking at network video uh, immediately, you, you can look at the, the feed and tell exactly what's wrong with the camera or the network itself. Um, and that was only, I want to say it was a three-day course. It wasn't that long at all, but very informative. Um, some of the insights I would suggest for fellow agencies, anybody, especially if you're a smaller agency looking to do this, is understanding what you're getting um, for the cost that you're paying for it. We had three different types of equipment. We had those box cameras. Some of those box cameras would range anywhere from four to 9,000, depending on how sophisticated the camera was, that was 100. And then we had some uh, 
the solar panel or solar powered mobile trailer units, the camera units, and they would uh, they would run about thirty thousand for one of those trailers. And then we had the LPRs, the LPR trailers, they would run us about 40,000. Of course, it's got a speed sign on it to detect speed of passing traffic. So it's not obvious that it's a license plate reader when you're passing by it. Um, as far as what we've learned, if you've got some hot spot in, in town, obviously the box cameras are the best way to go. If you're a more rural area and you have these hot spots come and go and it can be different areas, the one trailer for 30,000, that's probably gonna be your best bet. I would avoid LPR trailers altogether. If I was going to do LPR, I would do more of a fixed unit. That was our higher power consumption uh, devices. Uh, we spent more time dealing with batteries and getting those things back online power issues, equipment issues, and a lot of that just boiled down to them being solar powered. Um, so th there is some benefit to having them though, if you've got more than one area where you're really trying to, to get those LPR reads, obviously that trailer is your better option. But um, just for the cost, the headache of dealing with it, the maintenance, and then also just the roadside, how close that thing needs to be to the roadside and everything, you're, you're not going to get them in a lot of areas you would expect. So I, I would definitely, if I were running LPR, go with more fixed systems or even the mobile systems on top of cars and not the trailers themselves. Um, the other insight I would have is the research partner. If, if you don't have somebody on staff who can do this, and I doubt most people are going to have somebody with the capacity of a research par partner on staff to be able to, to be involved in a grant this large, um, this involved. Uh, they, they were, again, critical during our, uh, our grants. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have been able to probably never even procure the grant, but definitely not sustain it, have the analytical capability to be able to deploy the things where we need to deploy them, that they saw things that we didn't see. I mean, we, we've obviously been policing this town forever and uh, they come right in and they can see an area of town that we never paid attention to because the incidents were infrequent to us. It's not the type of crime that we would suspect would be an issue. Um, it, it's not the violent crime or anything like that. But um, when you looked at it over time, it was an area that just kept populating more and more crime incidents. And that just kept us up on those lists, kept our crime numbers uh, trending up. And again, it's just one of those areas we would have never thought to target before we, we you know, used them for that intervention. Uh, the only thing I could say that that would probably need to be examined again, from my opinion, is I, when I was looking at this, this grant uh, and our intervention, I did not see a whole lot on smaller agencies, smaller jurisdictions, our size. Um, and again, that's something our research partner noted in our final report is, especially with the mixed results, that if it could have been a longer amount of time, they're sure that they could have seen uh, more statistical uh, driven results that, that people could learn from. Uh, we still use them. Um, that is a continued partnership. Um, we're still carrying on every practice. I see this thing going uh, through my career and probably many more careers. I, I don't see it slowing down. We, we've, we've now expanded the camera project from where we started with the nine initial box cameras. I think we're up to 23 box cameras now. And that's from different businesses and uh, just the city itself, downtown coming in. They like what we did. They saw the, the results that we got out of uh, this equipment and they've decided that they were gonna fund those purchases themselves and make sure it got to those areas. Next slide, please. This is uh, my contact information at the bottom. Chief Bowles' uh, contact information at the top. He was supposed to be here with me on his presentation, but he had, unfortunately he had something come up during this time that he couldn't get away from. So, but he's he's knowledgeable on this project, just as knowledgeable as I am, and we can answer any questions. Thank you very much, Captain. Uh, I three key takeaways for me as we begin to pivot to Miami. 
are uh, the collaborative nature uh, of the work, uh, the uh, sustainability, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, this was driven by a local problem definition. Um, the uh, research partners were enthused and, and excited to be asked to participate. Uh, and I think, as the captain mentioned, this is going to uh, grow into uh, a partnership that ought to last quite some time because it makes it just makes so much sense for for both parties. Uh, a refrain that I think we would hear from our friends in Miami um, who are going to talk about their real-time crime center uh, and violence response initiatives. Um, and Rob Garrett is going to uh, lead them off. And I'm always interested to hear about this project in Miami. So it's overcome some hurdles and it's achieved a good deal of success. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Rob Jurette. I am the research partner on the Miami project. And for the sake of presentation, I'm going to be uh, giving an overview. Uh, we have the whole Miami um, team uh, on the call and, and they're available to answer any uh, operational questions. I'm going to focus on just a bird's eye view of, of what the project entailed and what our res uh, uh, evaluation uh, found. Um, similar, uh, but a little different from the other uh, project we heard from in the next one. Uh, this involved uh, the development of a real-time crime center capabilities. These are becoming more popular nationally uh, as, as a common practice in policing, still in the early phases. Uh, the Miami project was evolved out of their virtual policing unit that had been founded in 2015. I uh, believe the funding helped to kind of get this off the ground and, and uh, provide additional resources. It was formally launched in 2019 and it operates under the investigative support section within the uh, CID division. Uh, the unit is centrally located, uh, housed within the police department. It oversees uh, the centralization of all of the technologies um, that it deploys. And I'll talk more about that in a second. It provides real time support to officers and creates a virtual arrival scenario for officers uh, in developing situations. Next slide, please. The um, emphasis on the Miami uh, RTCC is, is very much incident driven. Uh, it, it provides a, a number of functions, uh, but it is activated from incidents either through active surveillance or through calls uh, for service. Uh, provides real-time incident response, uh, both prior to officers arriving at the scene, as well as during their arrival or uh, once they arrive at the scene, and then importantly, during the post-incident investigative uh, process. They're uh, along uh, to provide support throughout the whole um, process. Uh, it also can serve as a command center during uh, critical incidents, riots, protests, uh, or any number of um, um, tourist events that that take place. Uh, the 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 team was able to uh, put together a wide variety of technologies. In fact, we can't think of we're not able to identify any technology that they do not have uh, in use. Uh, the most common uh, and kind of the backbone of the unit is driven by CCTV, uh, gunshot detection systems, license plate readers, spatial analytics, and video analytics. By the close of the project term, uh, they were operating 582 cameras with nine full-time personnel, and they were able to provide coverage and support for 86% of weekly hours. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who have not had the, the benefit of vacationing in South Florida and Miami, um, city of Miami is a relatively dense urban area comprising 36 square miles second most populated city uh, in the state behind Tampa, I believe. Uh, even though the resident population is just under half a million, that swells considerably the service population due to tourist flows in and out, uh, particularly this time of year, uh, as well as uh, just suburban uh, work uh, force commuters on a daily basis uh, swells exponentially above that resident population. Uh, mostly Hispanic, uh, diverse with above average uh, rate of poverty. And like most major cities uh, or most cities in general, there are clusters and hotspots of, of violent crime uh, that they serve that they uh, must police. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the Real-Time Crime Center uh, provides support to any incident, any type of incident that happens that they are able to provide support for. However, this project was specifically focused on violent crime response. Uh, and the purpose of developing the Real-Time Crime Center under this project was to uh, try to improve the ability of officers and detectives and commanders in responding to violent crime incidents. And so that's what our analysis focused on and what I'll be presenting in the next few slides. Um, the objectives of our project was to, uh, one, assess uh, the development uh, of the Real-Time Crime Center, uh, how it was being used in the processing uh, of violent crime cases, and to determine the impact of those technologies on case outcomes. And we also wanted uh, a qualitative component. It became uh, important to understand uh, the officer and detective perceptions on how they were using it and how they perceived these real-time uh, technologies. Next slide. Uh, the project was carried out by the research partners, myself and doctoral student Kimberly Preslowski, who's also on the call uh, from Florida International University, as well as the Miami Police Department. Um, Kimberly worked embedded uh, within the Real-Time Crime Center 20 hours a week, uh, just like she would do uh, for a research assistantship. She worked alongside the uh, uh, real-time uh, detectives and analysts. Uh, we also uh, carried out a national survey of real-time crime centers uh, early on in the project uh, to give us an understanding and to handle what was going on nationally, and that was used in the early development. Um, other partnerships that, that um, kind of organically grew out of the establishment of the real-time crime center, the uh, police department was able to um, establish ongoing relationships with several business improvement districts and neighborhood management areas. Um, who donated cameras and provided technology uh, resources for the Real-Time Crime Center to, to monitor uh, and support, as well as the city's uh, solid waste management also provided cameras and actually had uh, signed one of their or some of their agents to sit in in the Real-Time Crime Center to monitor for uh, illegal dumping, uh, illegal waste. Next slide. So the, our assessment of the, of the project had three parts. Uh, the first part was a user survey of, we wanted to understand uh, the, the clients of the Real-Time Crime Center. Uh, and in that sense, we, we uh, uh, wanted to understand how police officers were using it, perceived it, how detectives and as well as net commanders. Uh, we also did a module network analysis to more um, precisely uh, visualize and determine the extent, uh, how and the extent to which these uh, evidence sources that exist within the Real-Time Crime Center, how they were being used and how they fit with more traditional uh, varieties of evidence, such as crime scene-based evidence, uh, witness uh, and other uh, human-based forms of evidence. And then lastly, we wanna understand the impact. Uh, were cases that were so-called treated or provided support of Real-Time Crime Center, did it improve their rate of case clearances and did it improve the time that it took to clear those cases? Next slide. Uh, to do uh, all of those uh, uh, facets of the evaluation, we started building from an incident log of real-time crime center cases. And this incident log was maintained by the unit detectives uh, and sergeant with support from Kimberly, uh, the research assistant uh, who did uh, kind of a validity check and if anything was missed in the heat of uh, heavy workloads. Um, and that was a, a base uh, log that, that told us, you know, what cases were being uh, provided support, what support it was, uh, what type of case, when it occurred, et cetera. So it was the base information. From that log, we developed an expanded analytical database. Uh, Kimberly spent a great deal of time uh, going into the system and collecting additional information that we would need to do uh, a sound evaluation. Uh, of the Real-Time Crime Center. Uh, and so that included additional information related to the incident, the type of support provided, the victim characteristics, the nature of the human evidence that was collected, crime scene evidence warrants, and the number of uh, officers that, that worked on the case. Uh, we also, for, for some of the later analysis, uh, drew a control sample that mirrored, for the large extent, the analytical database. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, when I get to the, the third part of the evaluation. Next slide. So the user survey, uh, we really wanted to understand that early on, we 
had not really thought of doing this. We were just looking at the outputs and, you know, that was what we were going to do. But we decided uh, as we got into it, it was uh, became apparent that we needed to understand one uh, to ensure that the technologies were being used and to understand the, the officer experiences, because that I think would translate uh, a lot for uh, other jurisdictions. And it's always uh, good to, to hear the perspective from the boots on the ground rather than uh, calling together a bunch of numbers uh, from, from a computer. So we put together a, a survey instrument. Uh, Kimberly and I uh, implemented these surveys in person uh, and it really sought to understand better how the technologies were being used. Next, next slide. Uh, we uh, we, we uh, used the incident log as a sort of a sampling frame to understand, well, what units were using the real-time technologies. Um, as the, the program was developed, uh, right, with more limited resources, it wasn't deployed universally across all jurisdictions. It started in some places uh, and then was built out from there. Uh, and so we used the incident log to tell us, well, where are the areas, what officers, what detectives are using it. And then we use that to develop a sampling frame. And then from that sampling frame, we took a random selection of uh, individuals. So no one could uh, claim that we cherry picked and only sp spoke to officers that uh, were favorable or disfavorable or what have you. So we randomly selected from that sampling frame. We identified 50 uh, and we were able to uh, complete 46 of those 50 interviews for a, a pretty good response rate, um, an excellent response rate actually. Uh, the survey was uh, made up of 29 questions, 17 closed ended and 12 open ended. Um, and we carried out the survey at the end, towards the end of the three year project term, which of course uh, would allow the time for the real time crime center to be up and running and, and to really have something to kind of assess and, and look at. Next slide. And so uh, a lot of more detailed findings, but uh, overall what we found were that uh, officers largely had embraced the real-time crime center, uh, that they uh, welcomed it. Uh, and not only did they welcome it, but they relied on it heavily, uh, that it had become standing, standard operating procedure for them to access the real-time crime center uh, for support uh, if, uh, information was not already pushed out to them. Uh, they reported feeling safer, uh, that they, they had an overwatch uh, and they had uh, the backup if they needed it. Um, they largely believed that it did improve their ability to identify uh, and, and document evidence. They largely believed it improved the clearance rates and they believed that it reduced the, uh, the time that it took to clear cases. Uh, and in fact, when we asked, you know, how could the real-time crime center be improved, uh, all they could really say was uh, give us more, right? They wanted more coverage uh, and they wanted more uh, coverage around the clock. Uh, and so it was really, um, you know, quite, quite uh, uh, interesting to see uh, how large uh, and, and incorporated into their daily practice and how much they, they liked it in our uh, in-person surveys. Next question, uh, sir, slide. Um, so to kind of, you know, the, the surveys told us that, yep, they're using it, uh, and on, from an evaluation standpoint, uh, it doesn't make much sense to do an outcome evaluation on something if it wasn't really being used, right? So, if, you know, if you're not doing your exercise and your dieting, there's no point in expecting you're going to lose weight. And if they're not using the technologies, there's nothing really to evaluate an impact on. Well, the surveys told us they were using it, uh, and that there was something to look at. Uh, and the network analysis allowed us to uh, put together a more finite picture uh, schematically as well as through uh, empirical estimates on the extent to which these technological evidence sources were being incorporated into case processing and how they fit uh, within the other more traditional uh, modes of evidence of crime scene and, and human-based um, testimony. Uh, next slide. And so what you have here is just a, a schematic of, of our findings. Uh, if uh, probably the most common, if you've, you've seen these network analyses before, it's been looking at gang violence or group violence in each of these, excuse me, nodes represent an individual. Well, we apply the similar framework, but we were looking at different pieces of evidence within the investigative process. 
So each of these circles or nodes represent a different type of evidence that was um, collected uh, in the investigation of cases. And if you look at the top three, one, three, two, those orange colored uh, circles, those are real-time crime center technologies, right? Pieces of evidence. Uh, the blue were crime scene-based evidence. The green uh, are the human-based evidence. And the yellow were warrant-based forms of evidence. And so basically just the number of connections, the lines that you see between these, the more they relate to those other types of evidence. And then the stronger or thicker the line between those circles represents uh, how strong that relationship is. So if you look at the top one, three, and two, you see the very thick line between there. And I came to refer once we started doing this analysis as those, those are the three horsemen of the Real-Time Crime Center. And those are CCTV, social media, and facial recognition. Uh, and those kind of all went hand in hand. Uh, and then you can see how they relate to the other forms of, of evidence. Behind this, which I don't have, I'm not showing, but this type of analysis gives us empirical numbers that allows us to compare uh, the centrality of each of these forms of evidence within the investigative process and see how, um, how strong of a, or central they are to the investigative process. And what we found was the real-time crime center uh, sources of evidence were equally as important as the other traditional forms of crime scene-based evidence and human-based evidence and warrant evidence. Uh, and so that was quite interesting. And it also told us that the real-time crime center evidence wasn't using being used by itself and they were getting it and they were done. It was used in addition to, right? So it was an added uh, bonus. Uh, and this was what many of the surveys uh, revealed that they saw it as an extra tool in their toolkits. Uh, for responding to, to violent crime incidents. And I think the, the hidden uh, finding here is also that um, because there are now more um, opportunities to develop evidence, it created uh, the ability for officers and detectives to triangulate information, to check, to fact check information, and not rely too heavily on any one uh, evidence source. And so it really uh, added to, I think, the validity of the cases uh, that they were able to process with the RTCC support. Uh, next slide, please. And so the, the last part of the evaluation, um, you know, in the surveys, uh, I did several observations and Kimberly was in there, you know, uh, every week. Uh, and there were, there were many media uh, based incidences of, of homicides and sexual assaults that, that kind of got attention of media that the real-time crime center was able uh, to identify evidence that led to an arrest of the suspect uh, within a very short amount of time. Uh, and there was a real perception by all of us uh, that, that yes, absolutely, these technologies are, are improving the ability to clear cases and uh, allowing them to be cleared in rapid time frame. Uh, so we wanted to test that on the complete sample. You know, you know, if you look only at small number of cases, it doesn't tell you what the normative is. And so uh, this third part, we looked at all of the cases uh, that were um, assisted by real-time crime center technologies and compared them to similar cases that did not receive real-time crime center support. And we tested that hypothesis. Was it improving clearances? Was it improving the time to clearance? Next slide. Um, and so this is where we relied on, on our expanded database and the um, control sample that we drew. Um, uh, and so essentially what we did is we, we controlled and made sure that our treatment sample looked very similar to our control sample. And so we stratified by crime type and neighborhood area. And then we randomly selected cases within each crime type in each uh, neighborhood area so that we had an equal proportion of homicide cases, aggravated assaults, assault, sexually assault, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and what, what this allowed us to do is to make um, as, as, as uh, most appropriate comparison as possible. You know, if we just looked at one neighborhood area to another neighborhood area, then someone could criticize and say, well, that neighborhood is historically doesn't cooperate with, with police. And so of course they're gonna have different 
case clearances. Well, we had equal numbers within, so we adjusted for that. And then we also used all of those other um, crime uh, case level characteristics uh, to adjust and control. And once we held everything constant, then we can get a better idea uh, of the impact of, of this type of support. Next slide. Um, we used a whole series of, of fancy uh, analytical models, but the, the important thing here is just to know that these models allowed us to um, create equivalency between our treatment group and our control group, right? We want to make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Uh, had we not used these types of regression modeling, we wouldn't be able to make the same claims. Next slide. So what do we find? Did it improve case clearances? Yes, absolutely. What we found after controlling for all of the different characteristics that could potentially influence uh, whether or not a case would be cleared, we found that real-time crime center cases had 66% better odds of being cleared. 66%, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and we did uh, a series of analyses and when we adjust for just the, the neighborhood uh, characteristics and the victim characteristics, the odds were still 39% uh, better. But once we adjusted for the other case level characteristics, that that uh, odds improved, uh, almost doubled uh, to 66%. So quite remarkable, uh, absolutely helped in, in clearing cases. Time to case clearance, uh, no, it did not shorten the amount of time. Despite uh, the, the anecdotal cases that we saw that happened within 24 hours, 48 hours being cleared, um, on the aggregate, real-time crime center cases uh, took longer to clear. However, once again, when you create an equal um, comparison, comparing uh, apples to apples and oranges to oranges, and we adjusted for all those case level characteristics, those differences went away in the time to clear. So they were essentially the same. We did a, a time uh, analysis and uh, essentially there was no significant difference between RTCC assisted cases and non-assisted cases. Uh, and then stepping back and you think about the investigative process, it's really understandable why uh, you might have a display of longer days um, because having this evidence that is provided through the Real-Time Crime Center allows for warrants to be uh, asked for, uh, submitted for, et cetera, et cetera, uh, more people to talk to, uh, and so that just inherently takes more time. So you're building, right, a more comprehensive case with better features of evidence. So it's not necessarily a bad finding that it takes more time. It is what it is. Uh, and I think we would all agree that it's better to build a, a better, more solid case, uh, even if it takes a little bit more time. Uh, but once we, we compare uh, equals to equals, uh, it really didn't take longer. Uh, it was about the same amount of time to clear cases. Next slide. Um, so overall, um, I, I think in, in Miami PD folks can can speak up if, if they want, but I, I think it's highly sustainable. I don't see it going anywhere. Uh, in fact, by the t even though it was started with uh, grant funding, I, by the time uh, it was it was finishing, I think they were trying to get um, uh, full time city funding uh, that would support the unit. They they running um, you know full time employees. Uh, everybody uh, that we spoke to wanted more and more and more. Uh, so I think this, as well as these positive evaluation findings, just give even more um, support for the idea that, that this is here to stay and this is, this is now uh, how they do business and will continue to do business in Miami. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then in terms of lessons learned, and, and again, the Miami folks are here and they can elaborate or answer any questions on this, but um, just to summarize some of the lessons learned, um, uh, the, the first is, you know, within the unit, uh, it's important. They felt it was important to establish clear roles for those employed. They experimented early on with multitasking and, and having analysts also serve in the unit. Uh, and it just didn't work out. And so, so from their experience, uh, it's better to have specialized roles within the unit that, that uh, the, the personnel can, can focus on. Uh, also, be careful for others that start these centers. Watch out for mission creep. There may be a tendency for other outside units or administrators to try to throw other responsibilities uh, on your back or in, in your, your portal there, uh, in your unit. Uh, do your best to resist that um, and, and stay focused on the initial mission. 
Uh, also, these things grow rapidly. And just in this three-year project, I, I watched it grow tremendously uh, rapidly. Every meeting we had, they were uh, building it uh, out exponentially and trying new things and new technologies. So, um, you know, anticipate growth and build it at the outset with the anticipation that you're going to grow. Uh, this way, you don't have to go back and repurchase equipment to fit a, a bigger size. This might involve uh, go ahead and signing up for cloud-based storage video systems, if you, you're going to outgrow any hard-based systems that you acquire inside your department uh, in a very short time frame. So just go ahead and build it for growth now. And then lastly, uh, maintain it. As it grows, uh, if it grows rapidly, you want to keep everybody trained, uh, establish your standard operating procedures and your pro protocols, make sure everybody in the unit knows those protocols, and also importantly, outside the unit, the people that are using the uh, centers resources that they know the procedures as well uh, and and stay on top of kind of the internal housekeeping as you go. Next slide. And that concludes the presentation. Uh, as, as I said, the Miami folks are on. We certainly uh, open to entertain questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rob. Lots of information, lots of really good information. I mean, to me, one of the, the real highlights uh, of the talk was uh, the partnership uh, that's developed and uh, what that means for the future. Um, we're going to get our next presentation going now. And uh, Jessica Herber, I assume, and uh, Lieutenant Smith will lead this uh, discussion about 20, 24 minutes, and that'll leave maybe time for a question or two, but certainly we'll leave uh, everyone with the contact information. Dr. Herbert? Perfect. I'm actually going to let Captain Smith start off first. We're going to bounce back and forth between this uh, presentation to kind of cover all of our bases. So, Captain? Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I'm PJ Smith. I'm the Investigation Bureau Captain for uh, Salisbury Police Department. Uh, uh, Dr. De Decker, you, you said it right at the beginning that there's things that we have in common and there are things that are different. Um, and, and I've noticed some of that throughout this, um, uh, hearing the first two presenters speak. Uh, and, and the research partner is a recurring thing and it, it, it is very valuable to the whole, the whole operation. So we'll get started if you want to go ahead to the next slide. So this is this is my favorite slide that I pre present anytime I talk about our crime center um, because you know, five years ago analytics was not a part of the Salisbury Police Department. So any map that I show you, this is the most important map that I feel like that Salisbury uh, can show. Uh, we are surrounded right here by three major cities. Um, we're we're there's a interstate that runs right down the middle of us. And connects it. So what this map tells everybody that I show is all roads lead to Salisbury. We are one of those small town cities with big time crime. Um, so that that that's this is my my favorite slide to show. Uh, it, it's in we have 82 sworn positions. Um, we 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 uh, 44 of them allocated to patrol. If you go back 22 years ago, we had 82 sworn positions. Um, but we've gone and what analytics has been able to bring and provide us is that in, tw in 2000, we were answering 10,000 calls of service, where now we're answering 35,000 calls of service. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, so anyway, we're located in the Middle District of North Carolina. Uh, we're also, Salisbury is located in the center of our county. Uh, and this is where the regional part of our center, uh, the the First name of it was the Rowan Regional Crime Information Center. A lot of people just refers to us as the CIC or the RCIC. Um, but there'll be a little bit of history. Uh, we'll talk about that as we go. You can go to the next slide. So our chief that just recently retired was very forward thinking. And it's important that um, you have support from your leadership from the top down in order for a project like this to be successful. Uh, and, and, and just as I heard Aniston was, we were finishing up with PSP uh, when we entered into SPI. And what came out of PSP was we were introduced to analytics. We had our analytics, we went from one, and within a year we had two 
crime analyst. And then we were also dabbling in the camera system. So we had five cameras. And at the time we were decentralized. We had a crime analyst sitting on one side with the violent crime investigators. We had another analyst working more with patrol and property crimes. Uh, and then we had a different person working on our camera operations. So we were very decentralized. Uh, when we were awarded the grant, it allowed us to combine those technologies uh, and put everybody in the same room and create a centralized location uh, for operation. And what we found was that bringing everybody together, we were missing out on so much information. Uh, a lot of information was not getting shared and not getting pushed out. Uh, SBI was able um, you know, to create that and help build out and put that centralized location. But not only that for our police department, but regionally uh, for other municipalities that surround our um, jurisdiction our, in our actual city. You can go to the next slide, please. So the breakdown in the structure is one thing that we had to develop once we had the room built out. Um, and like I said, we were already starting to get into the, the analytics a little bit, learning. Uh, and, and working on the cameras. We started with five cameras, and by the end of this year, we'll be up to 200, uh, maybe more cameras. Um, but it gave us a centralized location, and, and it gathered, it, it helped us contribute to working with our, our external partners, um, surrounding cities, our local sheriff's department. But it also reached out now to where we uh, communicate on a state level with our state partners. Um, Two hours up the road in Raleigh, North Carolina is where our State Bureau of Investigation is located and their fusion center is located. And they, uh, whenever they have something happen this direction, we're their first point of contact. Um, over to the right, you kind of see how the structure rolls. The uh, crime center falls under the office of the chief. So it's administratively uh, driven. And then it's a resource for patrol investigations and administrative. Uh, so, uh, Rob, you made a comment about be careful because other people uh, try to push things off and controlling the uh, work and make sure that doesn't happen. And that that is a challenge. That is a challenge. And um, but what we've been able to do in Salisbury, and I'm I'm, I'm glad to, I'm everything. The timing was everything was perfect with it. Uh, was it's true. In five years, we completely changed the culture to where the department went from being traditionally based reactionary policing to evidence-based forward thinking and the crime center, which in the early stages, and we'll talk about that a little bit, might've been the last stop for the investigator. Now it's the first stop for the investigator. And that also goes to patrol officers answering calls. And especially I believe uh, Aniston, Aniston uh, mentioned that as far as their traffic investigations, it has been a tremendous benefit to the traffic. Uh, our mission statement is to collect, evaluate, analyze, disseminate information and intelligence regarding criminal activity in and around Rowling County. Um, the last sentence that's highlighted in red is very important because of the camera part of it, following all applicable laws to ensure the rights and privacy of citizens. We have no camera facing anywhere where anybody would have an expectation of privacy. Uh, if we are going to do that, then we go through the proper court channels and get the court orders that we need. Uh, if it is for investigative purposes. Uh, so we always bring that up and uh, I'll, I'll echo now what I heard reoccurring. Public, uh, the public, there's been no negative response whatsoever to our crime center. Uh, and when it comes to the camera portion of the crime center, to me is a small part of analytics is a big part with cameras are a benefit and the wow factor of the center. Um, but once people see what goes on in that room, everybody wants one. Everybody wants, and I'm talking about the citizens, everybody wants a camera on their place. Um, so you go to the next slide. I think, uh, Jessica, you might pick up on this one. Yep, I will take it over. So one of the things, since SBI was just one of the stepping stones from Chief Jerry Stokes, I mean, he saw it as a way for us to um, address the underinvestment of people and technology within the department there. And I think this is where, you know, Salisbury being a smaller city, being somewhat of a more rural city, although it's been um, quite popular over the years of growth and, you know, thinking of like, this is the way that we've always done it and it's no longer working for us. This is not working. This is not helping us um, police. It's not keeping our community safe. And there has to be a different way of doing it. 
and I think, you know, Chief's approach and some of the leadership's approach at the time and that PJ's definitely um, kind of grabbed by the horns as he's been involved in the SBI project is that it really is about transforming the department to think and behave differently. And with that, we needed to make sure that everybody had the same language. And so, um, you know, and addressing not just buying the hardware or the software or the data storage for the uh, crime center, it was really about focusing on what are those components within an organization that helps it build its analytical capacity and actually change its behavior when it becomes data informed. And so um, we use, our, or the research approach here is using these five domains that is based in a variety of different um, organizational theory and technology and digital transformation research uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. And they kind of summarize to those three characteristics of how do we align our people and leadership and technology in a way that we can stay in this really kind of tight, sweet spot of operating um, proactively and under the best possible information or intelligence um, to deploy our resources and to um, you know, address crime or address community concerns. So when prior to SBI starting, this was an assessment that was done to kind of show you know, where, were, where was the Salisbury Police Department uh, having an opportunity to grow and what were the best funding sources or other types of strategies to kind of get it there. Um, and as PJ mentioned, you know, one of the kind of at the very beginning, one of the blatant things was people resources of just not having analysts or not having any kind of technical components within that agency. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of no's before we got some yeses and um, being able to hire crime analysts or a professional staff that had that skill set. But it was also how do we work these other components into um, the SPI project as we build out a crime center so that that could be sustainable um, for the agency altogether. So I think it's important for, for folks in the, um, you know, in the research space when we think about these approaches, it's not just that quantifiable uh, aspect. And I know everybody likes the numbers to measure to say that this is what's worked, but the digital transformation research and other kind of organizational and change management research tells you that those social and cultural contexts of a community or an organization are really important to understand as to how these components actually get implemented and then how do you build and grow them over time so that it becomes part of your departmental culture. So that was a key approach for us um, in the uh, implementing the Crime Center and we thought about it throughout all three phases um, as we built out the Crime Center. So you can go to the next slide and I'll turn it back over to PJ for those three phases. So our approach to it in phase one uh, through the procurement, we ran into a uh, a snag because that was right when COVID hit and everything shut down. So we had to identify a way to hold an RFP process with um, a, a shutdown. So we had really quickly had to learn and step up the tech technology piece and um, get that part of it taken care of digitally and virtually. And we had a lot of virtual meetings and a lot of things where uh, you know final vendors would come in and and give their ideas and opinions we couldn't we couldn't do so we would have to do the measurements ourselves and send it to them but we worked through that uh, so that was a challenge within a challenge um, phase two imp implementing was actually when we got got the doors open and, and coming up with our day-to-day -day workflows and how what what did the workflow look like how did we enhance or, or what meetings could we produce or what product do we produce that's going to be beneficial to our, our stakeholders, to our external partners, to our internal partners. How do we control that? How do we manage the business? And I'll tell you, uh, the one good thing about having analysts work for you is they document everything. I can tell you how many hours that they have worked with this agency, this agency, this agency, up to the day, year, or whatever. So they that, that's the good thing about having crime analysts. They, they justify their work by documenting their work. Um, which is not always the case in the industry that we work in, but it's it started to become that. So that's a positive. Uh, in phase three, um, working with the videos and the the camera part of it, um, you know, we, we don't just look at place places and hotspot policing. We also look at people or prolific offenders and, and using, uh, this is where I say that the cameras are the wow factor and they do help tremendously. But the analytics that comes out and the information sharing with the other agencies is crime doesn't know ju jurisdictional lines. And now that we have this 
centralized location where other agencies can come in and share their information with us and we can share their information with them. Um, we're, we're not displacing crime. We are, are finding long-term solutions to crime. And, and we also incorporate our, I'll give you an example, our, our, our PSN relies heavily on our prolific offender list so they can go and get their resources. Our district attorney strongly relies on our crime center for information on the people that are prolifically offending, especially in our DAs on board and that, that that's what's good. Um, you can go to the next slide. So like I said, creating the centralized location for Salisbury, kind of our breakdown in how we operate. Um, sorry, I got a question popped up. I was trying to read it. The, uh, how we use how we um, operate through our center um, is we have we have two main meetings, uh, or actually three meetings, but one of them is a biweekly meeting. So two main meetings that operate out of the room. Every two weeks we have what's called a biweekly crime meeting. The analysts put together and they run the numbers for violent crimes or for property crimes. But all the division commanders uh, come for patrol from investigations or our special investigations division. And the analysts run the, the last 60 days worth of information to kind of gauge and look at crime trends and where do we need to properly allocate our resources going forward for the next two weeks. Um, we take those those outputs or the, the outputs and the projects that the patrol lieutenants may take back and give to their their teams uh, to work on. And then once a month we have a, a comstat or command staff meeting uh, where we review the outputs and the outcomes. Uh, and we never, we, it's not the traditional comp stat where they put them up and make them sweat. It's more or less to see if they are looking at innovative ways to address the crime uh, for the solutions. And we'll never, never chastise an officer for being innovative as long as they stay within policy. If they, if they take on a project um, that they've gotten information from the center and they've truly, you know, worked on it and it's a failure, we'll stop, we'll look and analyze the project they put together maybe fine tune it, send them back out, let them try it again, because, you know, you can't give up on it. Um, so that's that's the two meetings that are that are critical. Um, the public, uh, we, we do invite external partners uh, into those meetings um, and and they they hold meetings and they take an interest in the crime center. Um, I think the next the next slide will be Jessica, and then I'll go in before I jump ahead myself and reporting. Yep. Um, so one of the important parts for us that are in FBI, because this was really about um, we're we're now um, building some we're physically building a space in the headquarters, but with that we are creating a new division and in an organization that didn't exist before. And with that, I think kind of Rob mentioned a little bit about, you know, defining roles and kind of those workflows and kind of who or what it belongs to. I think that was the really important part. We had the time and space, some of that because of COVID, some of that just because of the procurement process to think through, you know, what was the intention of introducing this new entity inside the organization and how would we kind of monitor some of those changes and the, both the resistance to that change and otherwise. And um, I think we all like to use the term operational research, but we don't really understand that it, it actually means that you have a, a bit of implementation science to it. Um, and why some operational research is just a re retrospective or reflective way of looking at things. Um, I think the other model that doesn't get um, acknowledged enough is that facilitated model, which is um, really supporting an agency and an organization through its change um, and not just researching as you go, but also kind of guiding them um, you know, through all of these things. There was a lot of like, I don't know, this is the first time I've done this. PJ's like, I don't know, this is the first time I've done this. And it was a lot of figuring out as a team um, and, you know, figuring out um, how to move forward, but also how to kind of address some of the concerns that we, we thought were not a concern, um, both internally to the department or externally to the community. Um, and then they would just come and bubble back up. And some of that was, you know, kind of COVID concerns. Some of that was other police protests and other things kind of going on socially and within the world of policing during the um, 2020 and 2021. And, um, you know, that's where this, uh, our approach from an evaluation standpoint was really about using those five domains 
understanding how the um, how the uh, kind of you know functions of the department worked, the interactions between people, technology, and leadership aligned, and so that's a lot of kind of top-down coding from a qualitative standpoint. And then within within each domain, kind of recognizing those emerging themes. What was it that triggered people to um, not address or not kind of advance as quick as the technology was, or you know, technology would kind of come on board, but then people would resist it or not resist it at different points. And so, really being able to kind of understand, um, you know, those themes within each domain and how that shifted throughout the three-year project. Um, and you know, it, it's been amazing to watch and all of the interviews and site visits. I've Salisbury is pretty much like a second home to me at this point. Um, I think um, I've you know there there frequently enough that everyone um, both in the department and perhaps most of the um, restaurants and stuff kind of know me from so much visits. But I think this type of approach is what really helped them um, develop that language in the department as well as with their regional partners. Um, so that it wasn't just we're going to force these cameras on you or we're going to force these analytics or we're going to tell you how to do your job or we're going to tell you where crime is as it was, um, you know, let's get everyone together and, and build up those both technical skills and knowledge skills. Um, but it didn't happen at the same rate um, for a lot of folks and PJ is going to talk about this in a minute. Um, they kind of heard what we said, they understood it, they said, yeah, that sounds great, but it was a lot of wishful thinking for them until they saw the kind of brick and mortar of the center or when they worked their first case with some of the analytics, when they saw that, um, you know, we, we could give them more support during a particular weekend because we knew that that weekend was going to have a higher crime rate than any other weekend based on five years of trend information and that would help with you know kind of what they were about to encounter um, and I think that was just really important to kind of see throughout the process so all those five domains kind of capture each of those pieces um, and kind of you know measure you know if you think about it it's like a little bit of blood pressure of when it's really high or low and um, all five of them together kind of um, build their entire board for that. Uh, one of the reasons why we like this model is that it really addresses the kind of digital transformation aspects of an organization, as well as, you know, the realities of, you know, you're going to have your younger officers adopt technology and adopt these things quicker than the folks that have already been in your department for a while. And some of that is just that generational age of what we call digital natives or other digital um, frequency folks. Um, and some of it's also just because, you know, people want to work smarter and not harder and how to kind of make those things work. So um, it's a kind of infinite process to continually grow. I think PJ's realized it, it wasn't just, oh, we're going to get this one analyst and then our problem's going to be solved. Um, he's now wondering how come he can't have probably seven analysts um, in that room. <laughs> and so um, I think that's where, you know, this is a constant um, process to evaluate those five areas, uh, think about where they're doing well, where they're not, what, how can you redistribute workflows or how can you redistribute some of the work in that way. And so um, that's where our kind of evaluation is, is a lot of qualitative information, but um, hopefully really in-depth information about how an organization truly adopts technology um, and thinks differently when it, when it it inserts something that didn't exist there before and then, um, you know, institutionalizes it within its uh, organization. So I'll turn it back to PJ to talk a little bit about some of the impacts and outcomes there. Sure. And, and I want to go ahead. I saw the question and, and just kind of address that because I know we're pressed for time. And uh, uh, Joe asked a question about how the real time crime center can help as far as tracking people. One of the one of the things and this is jumping ahead in our our um, presentation that we learned was using analytics in our video software uh, was tremendous. We didn't start off with it when we had five cameras because we didn't feel like it was the need. And somebody mentioned that, you know, it, sometimes it's worth going ahead and paying that extra dime to get the better quality or the analytics on, on your management system uh, than having to upgrade. We did have to upgrade about 50 cameras in our management system because there were too many cameras just to go back and review footage. Now, analytics, the more you use it with the uh, with, uh, management system, the better it gets. So you can key in clothing descriptions and it'll go back and cross-reference all your cameras. And we have used that to locate people when we have festivals or if we have protests, uh, it'll, it'll narrow down. And it also, we've been able to solve 
uh, some violent crimes as far as tracking vehicles that did drive by shootings because it also recognizes cars. I hope that answers your question. Um, so, so moving on leadership, uh, once again, I said that uh, leadership has to be supportive and they have to understand uh, the priorities that in the language and understand the data and form requirement that comes along with uh, running a, 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 the center. Uh, the uh, connect, connection among staff and case development, one thing that Rob, you said that you didn't see that we, that we did see, and I don't have the math and the numbers, is our case solvability did increase. Uh, we were solving cases faster. Uh, now, we don't inve we have one investigator assigned to our crime center. It's a gang intelligence detective. He's the only one working cases. The rest of it is more analytic and computer forensics and the cameras in themselves. Um, but detectives or police officers or, you know, patrol or the traffic um, investigators contact right off the first place they come now is a crime center. So we have seen um, an increase in uh, solvability and the time that we solve crimes from the traffic crash to the homicide. Uh, so that that was that was a difference. That was one of the things that Dr. Decker talked about that there was going to be some some differences. Uh, all right, I'm I'm going to move on now. Yeah, I'm going to speed us up since we're almost out of time, and I know everyone here and who will get the slides afterwards and when they're released would be able to read um, this slide. And the next slide talks about people and technology, which. Um, again, you've heard from us several times of just how those things interacted and, you know, helped all of the work processes along the way, um, particularly for the people of just aligning, PJ said at the very beginning, putting everybody in that room just kind of sparked this magnifying um, kind of way of doing work that we um, were hoping for, and they were very resistant against. They were like, we're going to get separated, and this isn't going to work, and that wasn't the case at all. Um, it completely magnified it. I think some things for us to walk away with is um, on the next slide, or excuse me, one more, um, on the scaling part is that, you know, this is where so many parts of, you know, when you get a grant and you do something for three years and then the grant funding goes away, um, you always worry of like, what's going to stay, like what's really going to stick and what isn't. And um, I think that's where, you know, the adoption and um, perspective of Salisbury Police Department as a learning organization and as an organization that's constantly looking at how can we be better, how can we work with our community and our public safety partners better, um, that they've been able to not only scale what they've um, done, um, finally, I think, finally convincing some of their regional partners, um, you know, when they could feel and touch and see it and visit the room. Um, they've had meetings from people all over the country that have come to the center to kind of see and how um, they've done thing and I think have, have expanded their reputation kind of nationwide coast to coast on those things as well. Um, and then I think the very last slide is our kind of, um, I believe this is the last one. Yeah, that's the sustained things. Uh, we're gonna do some more cool stuff over the next three years together. But I think this is the one that PJ probably wants to talk about the most um, of just, um, you know, we started this project off with COVID um, and a lot of things, both, both city management and in the police department being very abnormal. Um, and I think it really just showed the commitment of the leadership team there. Um, but also just the willingness to kind of stick with it and have that both learning mindset but also uh, that leadership mindset that was necessary for a transformation project like this. So PJ, I'll let you sh close us out with just talking about getting it to click for staff because that happened at different rates for you and was very frustrating at times, I think. And then Dr. Decker, Decker I'll keep this real brief and then we'll be done. Um, making it click. I, I, I was fortunate enough to visit Chicago and a couple of different districts in West Memphis and Virginia and so forth, because I know what works for other places may not work for Salisbury, but I took that knowledge and was able to tailor a model that worked for Salisbury. Uh, and then once we got centralized, it started to click when people could see it. Uh, and the biggest challenge that we have now is uh, managing the growth because it's starting to explode from other people and how we look forward uh, um, to doing that. And I'll stop there and then we can answer any questions that are left. Um, at this point. Thank you for letting me present today. Thank you, and thank you to all three of the groups uh, whose projects were presented today. Um, the slides do have contact information uh, for individuals within the police departments, and where relevant, um, the
the research partners, and you can see where uh, that the recording will be available at the website. Uh, and there's also an evaluation link to click. So we'd like very much to learn uh, what you thought went well, what we could improve on, and uh, and your insights. Uh, and then we would also encourage you to take a little bit of time um, to look at the uh, Smart Policing Initiative, the SPI uh, website on the CNA page. Uh, there are the 86 projects, I believe it is, uh, that are either completed or uh, for the vast majority or about to be completed. A uh, lot of really good information in final reports. Uh, if you're trying to replicate uh, uh, real-time crime center, there, there's uh, a handful and a half of SPI projects. But I, I think the thing that strikes me most is uh, how much uh, collaboration can really be a force multiply, multiplier for police departments. And it can also lead to sustainability. Um, I know Aniston now has a research partner they're going to depend on in the future. Uh, the work in Miami continues to hum right along, and you heard uh, Jessica say and BJ reinforce that um, for Salisbury, there's going to be a longer standing relationship uh, between their, their current research partner and, and their police department. And, and we think that that sustainable kind of in, in, uh, intervention is what it takes to make a dent in crime and make our citizens and our uh, fellow residents uh, safer and lead happier lives. I wanna thank um, Amada Bond for her help. Um, there is our S SPI link. Uh, and if you wanna contact us directly, spi at cna.org. We're thankful that you were able to join us today and look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Again, if you have ideas for what those webinars could do, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.